Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and welcome to episode 188 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise, coming to you, as always, live from YouTube. And it's another interview, and we have got an extremely special guest in the hot seat today. He is quite simply one of the most respected and lauded perfumers of our times, and rightly so. Not only is he supremely talented when it comes to pouring magic potions into bottles, there's no one quite like him for creating contrasts between light and dark, but he also has the rare ability to talk about and to explain his work in a manner that is totally compelling and accessible. And his knowledge of the history and heritage of perfumery is breathtaking and always informs his work in a meaningful way. He's made tons of extremely high profile creations which aren't officially credited to him and which he's not able to talk about, as well as many for which he is given credit, such as those for John Varvatos, Dolce & Gabbana, Elizabeth Arden, Ubigon Clinique, and Arquiste. So because we want to give him as much time as possible, please welcome to the studio the one-man force of nature that is Rodrigo Flores Rue, live from New York. Welcome, Rodrigo. Thank you, Dario. Oh my God, I'm going to believe the force of nature thing. My management might not be happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. So uh, I'm not going to dwell so much today on the, the past, Rodrigo, because there are lots and lots of interviews out there that that go into the, you know, the beginnings of your career, everything. But, but I want to go right into the present and say yeah. to you that as, as a perfumer, you you need to be interacting with the world you need to be experiencing the world you need to be going to art exhibitions you need to be watching movies you need to be traveling so what on earth has this last year been like for you in your role yes indeed this last year has been very complicated i think uh, for everybody you know uh, i am i am only like a like a little, little speck in the whole galaxy and of course i'm thankfully uh Myself, my family, my husband, we have not been, uh, you know, so directly touched by uh, any of the complications of the disease. Uh, and it has been, I think, like for a lot of people, it has been a moment of introspection. Uh, um, I do enjoy being at home. So the working from home and staying home is not something that was really kind of affecting me enormously. Uh, uh, we kind of reaccommodated a little bit, like everyone, either furnitures or you know the furnitures inside the inside the, the brain, in, in order to kind of uh, survive, particularly the, the first months of confinement. And it is true that I am a big traveler. I travel a lot. I go to Europe a lot. I go uh, visit my family in Mexico a lot. So it was it was very 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 shocking and very complicated to suddenly encounter this kind of no, you know, like stay there, stay put, don't move, uh, and 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 uh, try to survive um so uh i i i uh, start i read a lot all the time so i started reading more uh and then i started actually kind of exploring things you know in, in the internet that i was really not kind of doing like for example uh museum visits in, in in the internet and those were already very nice and uh with with the the health situation last last, last year many many important institutions kind of uh, I did themselves in that. And watching a lot of documentaries, um, I became very, very television oriented. <laughs> um, it was also a very complicated year in the in, in, in the, the state of politics of the United States. Uh, I, so, I wonder what on earth you could be referring to. Yes, do do yes. you think? Do you think this year will change how we interact? Oh, it, it, with it already feels. It already feels different. Let me tell you. You know, as a, as a an adoptive of twenty five years, but an adoptive New Yorker, uh, an adoptive American, I can tell you the feeling is completely different. Actually, uh, the feeling on November the seventeenth, when people just went out to the street celebrating that 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 beast was going was was done and he was not being reelected that was absolutely phenomenal and uh, and uh, people literally walk with a little skip in their in their in their in, in their in their in the steps and you know uh, uh, showing thumbs up all over the place because uh, uh, at least in new york you know we were basically wanting that particular you know period of history to disappear to to terminate and um, so i was glued to the television 
watching way too much the news, looking way too much at the numbers. I think a lot of people, we were doing that. Um, and then as a perfumer, working from home is very challenging because basically you imagine perfume, you can imagine, you know, the music a little bit like a, like a dead Beethoven, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, our labs uh, here in Midtown Manhattan were closed for, uh, for quite a long time. So, so I had like a big, like a big book, like a log of things that I wrote down. I invented a, you know, a creative funny name. I wrote down, uh, you know, what was it about? And it was, you know, my inspiration of the day. Very, very scantily, we were able to produce things that were really, really, really for very, very urgent, impending, complicated projects. But at the same time, many projects, you know, many clients also, you know, uh, were were in standby you know and and uh so that was that was also something 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 very 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 crazy that changed my mindset as a perfumer because normally as a perfumer you think about an idea and then the lab compounds it and then you smell it and it's uh, uh even you have to wait you know a little, a little bit of time and you know perfumers have to be patient here you know the patience was kind of okay let's see what happens with these ideas uh, I've been able, of course, to rescue, resuscitate, and revise many of them. Uh, now that we are more than fifty or percent or more, you know, staffed back in the of, in the office and the lab in the labs here in New York, etc. But it was it was a time to reconvene, to think about the ways I was formulating, I was inventing perfume, that I was uh, modifying them. Normally, I'm quite methodical, and I believe in putting. A and B together, A and C together, B and C together, and all of the above in a, in a typical Cartesian product. That's the way I work. Uh, there's many ways of working, but that's the way I work. And um, so I revised that method in order to be a little bit more succinct and a little bit more uh, daring and taking more quantum leaps with my, my modifications in order also to save, to save time and resources. So that was kind of a reorienting a little bit of the other focus. So, of the so uh, a, a year of sort of change and reassessment in a way. Now, yes. I'm, I'm going to move us on, but I will say that um, lots and lots of comments are coming through. So thank you to everybody for tuning in. Hang on to your questions. I have a feeling that you are all going to have so many questions for Rodrigo. I will tell you when it's OK to, to fire away with your questions, and we'll pick some and put them to Rodrigo. And if you are able to say where it is that you're watching from, um, it's always nice to know where in the world you're watching from. Absolutely. One thing I should say as well is, uh, please be aware that in the live chat, you are uh, put, putting comments down in a, in a public forum. So do not put anything in a public chat that you are not happy being made uh, public. So bear that one in mind. OK, <laughs> we, we, I'm fascinated by your background, Rodrigo. This is your Givaudan office in New York. Yes. What can, you, what can you tell us about some of the things that we can see there? That's just, you just want to get in there and... Well, well, listen, you know, right behind me, there's, you know, some postcards or, you know, clippings of magazines, etc., etc. I am a big person of art. Uh, I'm, I'm an art lover and an art, and an art observer. Uh, so, for example, here you have Paulina Bonaparte Borghese by Canova. Uh, this is uh, a bust of Antinous in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. These two very, very sickly looking young fellows <laughs> are the... The two, the, the two sons of, of Sir Walter Son, the architect, the one that has that beautiful house museum in London. That's Michael Fassbinder. This is um, a Holbein portrait of a eligible uh, young man uh, showing a, a red carnation, and you know that means that he was eligible. Um, well, here you, you see a little bit at the rear of a, of a Toreador. Why not? That's the famous rhinoceros of Albert Durer, etc. So. Uh, and and a huge poster for shocking now ah, is shocking yes. is, is shocking an important touchstone for it you is, it is basically one of the most important perfumes in my life because it is my it is uh, as perfume goes it is my first perfume memory when i was a little kid um i was very 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 little uh i want to say maybe three or four uh, this is back in mexico city where i was born and um my uh, my mom had a younger sister, Bernadette, and Bernadette, uh, uh, I love her. I absolutely love her. And uh, she, I always, I don't know, I love to go through her drawers. You know, that is something, I don't know, naughty little kid. And I remember one day I kind of opened a, a, a tall, you know, kind of a cabinet, in a drawer, drawer chest. Was, I opened something like that, and I went like that with my hand. And the only thing that I could grab was this 
tiny, tiny, minuscule bottle of shocking Schiaparelli. And I remember I couldn't read, but I remember that it looked like two little signatures. And the bottle is absolutely tiny. And I understood, I already knew what was perfume. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful, so I put it in my pocket. I literally stole it from my aunt. <laughs> and guess what happened? Of course, the bottle leaked. We all know, uh, even uh, with uh, going going into into vintage bottles, shocking this Caparelli is not a timid perfume. It is a strong, chunky, odoriferous substance. And, well, it's shocking. That, it's shocking, isn't it's it? Shocking. Yeah. My yeah. my mom would dress my my brother and I. Were, my brother is two exactly two years older than me, so she, she would dress us always alike with really short shorts. I, and I have tons big pictures of that. And this tiny little little Spanish sh uh, shirt that were bottled up of here with little laces. That was we're all picturing this now, Rodrigo. <laughs> and I had cute little crooked legs. Anyway, so I remember very well that I am kind of just seeing this yellow amber stain growing on my on, right here on, on on the leg on, on my on 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 my on my thigh, and well, of course, suddenly there was the smell, was the smell, was the smell, and my mom is telling my grandma because my my own Bernadette was was single and she was living still with my grandparents, and, and my mom. Did you put on perfume? What is that perfume? My God! Uh, and, and it smells familiar, but at the same time, smells very strong. Blah, blah, blah. And then I'm there, standing in front of her, whatever. And then she sees this kind of really, really big, big, big blotch of, you know, orange liquid that uh, certainly is not urine. Let me tell you. And and my mom, what is this? Oh my God! And then she puts her hand in my pocket and takes the little bottle out. Well, I got berated because I was going through my, my because I had to say, yeah, I was opening Bernadette's drawers, etc., etc. And then my mom, and it smells so strong, and this is such a strong perfume, and blah, blah, blah. And I, I was very, very reprimanded. I was caught in the, in the, in the, in the, in the naughtiness. And um, the shorts ended up in the garbage can. And uh, 45 years later, I became a perfumer because of shocking the Schiaparelli. So uh, you can't beat that story. You can't cannot, beat that yeah. story. We've had a few people coming around saying where they're watching from. We've got Paul Selection watching from Bangkok in Thailand, Rodrigo. I see that, yes. Gonzalo is saying hello from Madrid in Spain. Ka B is not too far away from you from San Diego, California. It's and still I think, far. <laughs> it's in the West Coast. Well, it's still, it's still <laughs> far, but it's not as far as Bangkok. And Hamlet Wong is watching in Ontario, uh, Canada. Let us talk very, very concretely now about, you know, so you've got shocking at one end of your um, chronological spectrum. Let's yeah. come much, much closer to the other end. And we should say congratulations to you because uh, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, that Misfit for Arquiste has been nominated for a Fragrance Foundation Award. So a sincere congrats to you. you. I think it's probably fair to say that in the sort of independent perfume world, you really came onto a lot of people's radar, uh, certainly perfume fans, through Arquiste and your collaborations with Carlos Huber and, and your work for Arquiste. I don't have a bottle of a Misfit to show here, unfortunately. I have a little vial, but I didn't want to bring it here because it, it's not attractive as, as a full bottle. But tell us a little bit about the, the story behind Arquiste. Well, that, that's it's essentially, go on. Yes, yeah, that project is absolutely a, a, one of my dear, dear projects. And you know, seeing seeing it nominated, you know, the the slide, uh, you know, with Linda Levy herself, the president of the Fair Foundation in the United States, mentioning the nominees, which of course, you know, it's a big, big fanfare and so on. And Arquiste Misfit was nominated for the best fragrance in the indie category for this year. It's you know, I think it's a culmination. Of, uh, you know, as we as they say in the Oscars, either you win the Oscar or not, but the nomination is what really counts. And um, it's not really true. No, it's kind of half true, but it's okay. It anyway. is true. It yeah, is. Yeah. True. <laughs> well, anyway, um, Misfit is a story. It's a little bit of a, a little bit of a reflection of the story of, of the friendship that Carlos and I we have. Uh, we have become very very close uh, friends and collaborators. I'm, uh, Carlos and I met in 2009. So uh, so in, in 2019 we uh, we were anniversarying 10 years of friendship and of, of a working relationship that has brought into into life now i want to say over 30 fragrances wow so we, we have done collaborations um 
we have done, you know, uh, some turnkey projects. Uh, I might talk about one uh, later on, which is a lot of fun uh, that he has coordinated, etc. And of course, his line are keys that boasts, you know, really, really interesting perfumes. As, as you know, the mantra, the mantra of of, of our keys is to uh, depict or tell a story that has always a historical background and reenact re or reproduce or create the smell that you would be uh, uh, experiencing while kind of witnessing or being part of that moment. This comes also from the fact that Carlos is an architect, but he also has a, spe uh, a specialization in uh, what we can call uh, responsible renovation, responsible uh, restoration of monuments. You know, that kind of, uh, like David Chipperfield, that he doesn't kind of makes a building again all glitzy and gold etc he leaves a little bit of the patina here and there and a little bit of a crumbling wall over there and that's a little bit the story so we have we have uh, let's say have found inspiration and reenacted um, uh, things very that are very diverse that go from mexico in the 1970s in the disco world of acapulco in the case of el and ella or in the case of floricanto uh, you know the love uh, the strange love of flowers for the Aztecs and the flowers that were sacred and ritualistic to them. Um, we have look naughty nuns, uh, naughty nuns making chocolate. Naughty nuns, naughty chocolate for uh, for Animalusias, which is uh, it is that color. It still keeps that color almost that represents the mole. So you know, uh, a dear perfume of mine. But since the beginning, uh, I have always you know and and. I have helped Carlos develop his nose and he and his uh, his sense of perfume, uh, even if he if he had had it innately. And one of the things that you know, that we have done here is actually sitting in my office. In many cases, is like you know, okay, this perfume is very complex and it's very baroque because of a reason. This perfume is very simple and let's use even the word linear or monolithic because of a reason. So there's reasons for both. And there's places for both, and why, and 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 uh, strength has to be just right. But it's good to have a strong perfume, but sometimes it's good to have a light and subtle perfume because of you know all of these all of these uh, ontological questions of perfume is something that we enjoy talking about. You know, Carlos is also very sensitive to art. Uh, uh, we share a lot of common common tastes in, in when we go to museums and so on. So uh, since the beginning when we started working together, I concocted a, a simple accord that was quite woody, ambery, and it had an enormous amount of patchouli essential oil inside, inside, inside. And uh, just as a, you know, as a wink, I call it Pacharles, you know, the patchouli for Charles, Carlos being Charles, you know, and uh, I think I gave it to him for a birthday or something. And we revisited that story uh, or, or for example, he would tell me, "Can you give me a bottle? You know, like ten, two, two or three years later, can 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 you prepare me some of that pacharles, etc." And I would always kind of give him the bottle, but I would tweak it a little bit and said, "Oh, it was a revision. You know, I revised it again. Oh, you know, I added this thing, uh, or 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 I changed I changed the bergamot for a better one. You know, that kind of thing." So our pacharles was always kind of there. You know, it was always kind of a companion, a place to go and think, a revisitation of sorts. And uh, there's a moment that, you know, and, and that happens to Carlos a lot. He, you know, he has eureka moments and they're very, oh, they're always interesting. And he said, you know, I want I want to work on, on Pacharles. We had we had worked previously on Nanban, which was a complex perfume that had this patchouli story happening, uh, etc. I am a patchouli lover, that's for sure. And and I have been working in, in, in things that are patchouli leather or patchouli wood or patchouli for, for other brands. And we can talk about that as well later. So um, so we revisited it and I really loved the minimalistic, almost brutalist rawness of, of our pacharles. But Carlos wanted it to be a little bit more palatable. So we, we we did quite some intricate work. Uh, when you smell that perfume, but you see the potency, you see the the the, the almost almost you know like uh, imperious uh, presence of actually three kinds of patchouli that we concocted and we constructed the whole thing, etc. But then 
we added a very ambery background, sometimes animalistic, a little bit leathery, etc. And then we play with other interesting notes that sing and chant around the perfume. And the idea of patchouli is that um, Carlos is a big pass passionate of, of, of European uh, history, uh, history of the, of the 19th century. And there has had always been this kind of reflection about, about patchouli being the, the perfume that was the favorite because it was very much in vogue because of, of Josephine de Beauharn loving the, the Indian shawls, uh, this, this beautiful shawls made of cashmere that came from India, and they, they, they came protected in boxes with patchouli leaves. So that scent was the scent of aristocracy. And when the Napoleonic years ended uh, and that fashion uh, you know, faded away, those shawls ended up basically being, being purchased by wannabes and even you know by women of ill repute let's say uh so my favorite from, kind yes so be from being you know the perfume of the aristocracy or the imperial aristocracy it became you know the perfume of the slums let's just call it like that uh and then it made a big comeback possibly through the great fantastic girlens of the 1920s and 30s very very important in bandi you know very aristocratic french perfume but then patchouli kind of went again into kind of a bad rap because of the hippies the head shops the flower the flower power etc etc and then there was a time in the 90s that there was no perfume with patchouli patchouli was a but no we're not going there but then Angel, Angel by Thierry Müller came with a very big dose of patchouli. So again, it became like in the forefront of, of uh, vanguardist perfume. And, and then the big, the big new shippers happened and this and that and the other. And then, you so, know. So, that... so, the, so the misfit is the patchouli. Exactly. It's this, it's this yes. misfit through history. That's it been... is a misfit of perfumery. And you know, there's even in, in Mexico, we say like when some, something, somebody smells like, oh, well, huele yeah, a patchouli, you know. And uh, well, you know, is that good or bad? Because for me, you know, it has, it has always been good, you know. I have a friend, his name is Patrick, he puts patchouli oil on, on, on him, and he smells fantastic because it goes very well with him. He's very, he quite, he's quite skinny, he has very nice salt and pepper hair, but it goes very well with him. And you know, he's there also, because of course, you know, it smells strong and so on. So it is the misfit. And uh, we did not come to the name, and we said, name that we found together. We were at a restaurant in Soho, and then the the name just came like that. I said, oh, my God, it's going to be completely, you know, registered, taken by people, etc. And finally, you know, he was able to go with it. And uh, and I was very clear that I wanted, you know, because Carlos also plays with a, with a graphic look of the names. So I said, you have to do something crooked about it, you know, or either, I don't know, maybe like, you know, somebody who's writing that is drunk or, you know, like has or has kind of a little bit of strangly, strangly uh, 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 penmanship. And then... Carlos ended up with this, you know, slanted, a little bit odd, very big letters, and then the S, you know, in the center, being a little bit off. And and that's exactly what we wanted to be. You know, I always believe that the perfume that is too smooth and too perfect is not good. Uh, I always say that uh, uh, you have to have the pebble in the boot. As you know, I wear boots every day, and you know, and having the pebble in the boot is something that is really annoying, but you can live with it. And because it's annoying, it makes your life interesting. And and that is always I, I work with that idea of uh, a person that is too perfect uh, is uninteresting. You know, you have to have an accident in the way. And uh, and here we were just kind of just looking at the accident and make out of this accident a big, big thing. And uh, I, I, I love listening to I could listen to your stories for hours, Rodrigo. But the thing is, we don't we don't have hours. I know. And, and at the moment, at the moment, people around the world, including from Istanbul and uh, Israel, they're sitting there thinking, how do I get Rodrigo to give me a bespoke perfume for my birthday? Like <laughs> you did for Charles. Now, listen, you have a very, very grand uh, title. You are Vice President Perfumery Givaudan. Yes. So I would like to ask you. What does being a vice president mean? And also, who is the president so we can assassinate them and make sure you become president? <laughs> oh, my God, that's way too flattering. No, but president is a title of, you know, like, uh, 
let me decorporate a little bit here. It's a title of, you know, marking the path for people. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's a little bit different. The vocabulary dif differs from different supply of different perfume companies. But you have like junior perfumer, perfumer, senior perfumer, master perfumer, this and that and the other. So it is, it is, it was basically when I was a perfume, uh, senior perfumer and I was made a vice president, I was my uh, vice president for the cer a certain, a certain list of characteristics uh, and, and of accomplishments is important. And I think one of the things that is important is to have perfumes that have, that have, that you have made that have become uh, a milestone uh, let's use the word a sustainable uh, you know presence in 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 the commercial in the commercial or or in the mantra in the in the in in, in the mind of people not not that not because you, uh, this perfume has hasn't made a ma many 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 millions of another hasn't been important to uh, for that and so that is for me is an, homa an, an homage to what i do because i am first and foremost i'm a craftsman uh, i call this a craft some of the results of this craft are pieces of art but I don't love saying that perfumes are artists because I find it a little bit. Uh, that's why I never say I created or I, I want to create, you know, and I, I'm not getting religious here, but creation comes with a capital C somehow. So I do like the word artist because it's cheeky somehow. Oh, you know, <laughs> the, the artist is not in the atelier today. I kind of like that, 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 you know, derivative vocabulary. Um, but it's it, it also it, it's also a question of experience of 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 the importance that you have in your company. So for me, uh, you know, achieving getting this I'm going to call, say it like that getting this promotion was absolutely an honor, a privilege, but also a pleasure because it was also a demonstration that 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 Gibaldan cares for me and that I care for them. Gibaldan is home, and uh, and uh, you know it's just you. you yeah you become a little bit a little bit one of the faces of the house no and 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 i think you once told me that you're also an original questy is that the way you put it you that's yeah. for sure that's yeah. for sure because you know uh, it it will it will be very important to say that if, if somebody would write a, a book about the perfumery of the 21st century one of the important things that you have to do in the historical or anecdotal or you know uh, uh, facts and moments of 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 uh, of how the perfumery industry uh, was configured in the odds and in the 2010s was basically, you know, the, the purchase of Givaudan. Uh, Givaudan bought Quest International, Givaudan being a Swiss company and Quest International being a smaller, uh, I would say edgier, um, why not edgy, a little bit quirkier uh, company that was anglo Dutch, And I had been a Questy for almost a decade when, when our our merge with Givaudan happened and uh, so it was it was a, a clash of titans I would say 90 percent positive uh, the 10 percent were not that they were negative they were sad because we lost friends we lost people uh, in, in that's the way with you with M, M, M and A's mergers and acquisitions that's what happens mm -hmm. um, but I was very happy to 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 actually you know to come back to Givaudan because actually my first job as a paid perfumer was being a trainee at Givaudan back in 1991 when Givaudan was not united with Ruhr that is also a very momentous union that happened a decade before and I had the enormous uh, fortune to be chosen to be the trainee uh, uh, the, the trainee working under Jean Claude Elena so that was also I, I always mention it uh, and I I take a lot of pride about that and, and Jean Claude taught me a lot of things and um, and wow. some of them, some of them I cherish and use at work, and some of them I ca I, I, I contradict uh, contradict on purpose. Yeah, well, active rejection is is something very important in this. No, no, of... it's not re it's not rejection. So I said, no, I'm gonna, you know, like I'm, I'm thinking the opposite, and let's see yeah. what happens. You know. No, absolutely. Now, those of you watching, and I think Rodrigo, you as well, you may remember that when I interview people, I, I like to do games. Now, if you're thinking that what I'm going to be doing next is the 20 blotters for Rodrigo, you're wrong, because actually Rodrigo was one of the original people on whom I inflicted my 20 blotters many, many, many years ago in London. So we're going to do something different. Now, I know you love your classic perfumes, you love uh, heritage perfumery, and you also know so much about it. <laughs> so I am going to call out the name of a note or a particular ingredient and i want you to say without thinking which historical perfume you would say is like a kind of standout example of featuring this note and this is when 
Mr. Flores Rue, Vice President, has to try to be concise. <laughs> All right. Right. We'll start you off easy. Let's go, Jasmine. Jasmine, I am going to go with Diorissimo by Christian Dior. Oh, and most people would have said, ah. Yes. Ah, no, because <laughs> Diorissimo is always a you get to people. But no, without, without, without Jasmine, Diorissimo, Diorissimo is nihil because actually uh, Diorissimo is a Jasmine uh, um, using um, a costume, you know, like, like uh, interpreting a, a Lily of the Valley. The Jasmine disguised as a Lily of the Valley. Disguised. That was what I was looking for. Exactly. Cool. I like it. I like it. Vetiver. Vetiver. Well, uh, it would be disingenuous to say Vetiver de Guerlain, honest to God. So I'm going to go with a little bit odd. Odd one. Uh, Calais d'Hermes. Calais d'Hermes carries, carries a, a, a very interesting pseudo sheeper thing, feeling. You know, it is, it is characterized as a floral, the hedic, but Calais d'Hermes ha, has, a, has a parallel theme that is. Uh, Cypress, frankincense, essential oil, vetiver, and patchouli. That without that, the floral, the floral uh, aldehydic richer uh, is a little bit too too powdery, too bland, too 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 moo moo. So, and then every single time I smell kalesh, my nose goes directly to the vetiver part. Cool. Go this, this this is where conversations with Rodrigo get interesting. I have to bring this comment up. Moaz is saying we need a maison Rodrigo Flores Rue. I think. <laughs> Well, <laughs> let me let me be, be coy and let, let's say that I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> and you are saying, can this interview never end, please? We, we we may have to bring Rodrigo back later. Okay, third oh, one. We're afraid of what you desire. <laughs> uh, this is true. Next one, violet flower. Violet flower, the flower per se. Uh, Jolie Madame by Pierre Balmain. Uh, Jolie cool. Madame, when you smell it, you know, it is a chypre on the genealogy of a scandal, or it is a kind of a very, very softening thing of the leather leather aspects of a Vandy or a Piguet, the same perfumer. But there, uh, Germain Cellier uh, kind, of, kind of incremented the florals using a little bit of uh, Lily of the Valley accents, but a lot of ionon, and then the very, very important cucumbery, violet, odd fruitiness of methyl octane carbonate, and that those notes of, of violet, violet, uh, violet leaves that are green, crunchy, cucumbery kind of thing. So for me, I already find this violet tone in Scandal, and for, for me, Jolie Madame is exacerbated to to a maximal potency. It's a perfume that I adore. And then it goes it goes to other perfumes like Ladies de Valenciaga and other things like that. This is so cool. Well, there are hundreds of us now having the total geek out listening to you. This is amazing. Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle. Well, honeysuckle per se is not really like a raw material in perfumery. Uh, and honeysuckle, you know, it's kind of, honeysuckle is in the eye of the beholder. That is the problem with that, you know, because honeysuckle has a lot of entries and, you know, some people get into the really watery part, some, some people get into the indolic animalic part, etc. So it is very difficult to find a honeysuckle perfume per se. Uh, so historically speaking, um, let me think. You know, funnily enough, and I have seen it mentioned in the press, maybe back in the 70s, um, sometimes in Osovash, there's moment on where that that heady on transparency, a little bit, you know, white floral happening, it is a chevrefeuille moment. Um, this is mm -hmm. an old one. Because, like I said, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. No, fine. The honeysuckle has, has secrets in its, its metabolism that we have not been able to record. Let's do another huge one. Rose. Rose. Mm, I'm going to go with Paris by Yves Saint Laurent. You know, it's one of my favorite ah. perfumes. Uh, that's, uh, that's an excellent perfume. And it's evocative, it's beautiful, it's rich, it's layered, it's big, it's bold, but at the same time it's refined. It reflects exactly the brand. It looks like the bottle. You can hear Sofia Grossman talking when you smell the perfume. And what I love about, about, about Paris, and, and I like it because it happens in other, in other some other of her perfumes, but in this one is perfect, is the anamorphosic moment. Because it is violet rose, and you do not know if you are seeing the calyx or you're seeing the two profiles kissing. That's an anamorphosis, you know? So it is so well played in such an exquisitely balanced perfume that is also very emotional and very joyful. And, uh, and it smells like roses, like there's no tomorrow. Leather. Leather. Uh, you know, I'm going to go with a, with, a, with, with a fragrance that I 
always find a little bit of pudding, but because it's of pudding, it's absolutely sensational. And I already mentioned it is Bandit, the Piguet. And leather is, again, what is it? Like a Russian leather with a Lucy, or are we talking about only about birch and cat or burnt nose, or are we really focusing ourselves in an animalic, you know, burnt potato, isobutyl quinoline? Uh, this is all of the above in Bandit. Uh, Bandit also was created during the time of war. Uh, it was created dur dur during dur during the Second World War and actually during the Nazi occupation in France. And this extremely strong smell of gunpowder that this perfume has for me, uh, and this is a theory that I am uh, one day I'm going to write a book about it. That for me is like this, you know, French people wanted actually to wear the smell of gunpowder in order to eliminate it from the atmosphere. So it's actually the smell of war in that particular perfume, and it has always intrigued me. And for me, it's also very telling of the fact that just after, you know, the, the armistice of 1945 and the, and the new houses of uh, fashion in France started creating perfume, they started making perfumes that were very green, that were actually kind of uh, going against all that, you know, drab, powdery, mm -hmm. uh, dry, burnt smells of perfumes in the war. Um, as you know, I'm a big, big wearer of leather. So then when you go into the leather, the atmosphere, the walking into a boot store or a saddle store, etc., etc., that's another story that's a little bit more modern. Uh, but, you know, one of the quintessential leather perfumes. No, absolutely. Carnation. Carnation. Um, well, carnation is a difficult flower because uh, uh, spices can be of pudding. But I definitely want to go to Beloja. Uh, okay. Beloja by Caron. Beloja is definitely, you know, and that's again a little bit disingenuous because it is, you know, it is a conception of, you know, uh, the carnation perfume being Beloja because also the Isle of Bellagio and, you know, the story says that the, 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 the Caron guys, you know, uh, Madame Van Pouilly and Ernest Altrov went to Bellagio and they found, you know, this field of carnation. And carnation is a little bit of a misfit because it's yeah. a flower that is in held in very big esteem, like I mentioned, the carnation of Holbein. But also is that the, the green carnation is like the way of, you know, Oscar Wilde saying he was gay, but no. But at the same time, carnation is a cheap flower. They're particular, they're, sometimes they're not very, very pretty either. Sometimes they smell like plastic and so on and so forth. But, you know, this very strong spiciness is very important in the development of perfumery. I am lately observing and looking a lot at Caron and how, how Ernest Daltroff uh, achieved this absolutely incredible balance between a lot, a lot of spice, a lot of eugenol, next to a lot of rose and next to a lot of iris. And that accord, it is quintessential in basically all of the Caron perfumes. And Beloja, of course, is a standout. However, you find that peppery floralcy in many of his lesser known perfumes. Uh, so and some of them to like almost kind of mind boggling effect. So Beloja, Beloja is a carnation. Absolutely. And I'm going to do the last one. There's so many. To, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Iris. Iris. Well, people will go to Channel 19, and um, possibly I'll give a, I'll give a, a, a little wink to 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 a quintessential iris that is not Channel 19, that is not a floral green, which is Aprelonde by Guerlain. Oh, uh, thank you. Aprelonde is uh, is a predecessor of many things. It is a simplistic formula, if you will. Maybe you know the Guerlain people won't say I'm I'm I'm, I'm crazy, but. It is simplistic because it has, you know, the three or four big, big elements of that perfume are very, very present. And you see wow, you see how the perfume is constructed. And you see also that the, uh, uh, the enormous amount of orris materials, either is the absolute or the bare or the concrete or both or, or a mixture of them, play a very important part of it. And also, I love the conceptual part of it because iris is a right, it's a rhizome, you know, it's something that is in the ground. So it certainly has an earthy, carroty smell to it. So uh, using that into the most luxurious of combinations with heliotrope and the vanillas, etc., that will be actually Aprelonde is without a doubt the mother of Leur Bleu. And but then naming that uh, something that could be kind of you know mixed up with something very very banal like the smell after the rain for me is genius. It's, it is for me one of the top 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 conceptual perfumes of the beginning of the century.
Rodrigo, I didn't think I could love you more, but uh, thank, uh, you, thank you for giving that one a name check. Thank you so much for that. You'll be pleased to know that you passed the test and you can now become Vice President of Perfumery. <laughs> now, the, the time is going so quickly. I should say to people who've just tuned in, you're watching Love at First Scent with me, Persilace, and we have the one and only, the inimitable Rodrigo Flores Rue in the studio. So start sending your questions now and we will put some to Rodrigo. And if you are able to say where you are, that would be great. A few questions were sent in earlier through Instagram and I'd like to put one of them to you now. This was from Bianca. Thank you very much, Bianca, for sending that in. How does it work with reformulations, Rodrigo? Do you participate in the reformulations of perfumes that you made, or does that just happen in a different way? Do the brands go to other people? How, how does that work? Well, it depends on what, what, what perfume and for what purposes. Reformulations have a lot, have, have a lot of applications. Either uh, a company wants to relaunch something that is completely, you know, like, okay, they own this brand, they own this name, etc. you know, it's lingering in a drawer, etc. So let's relaunch it and let's do a completely different thing. They use the name and then, you know, it becomes a new, you know, a, a new commercialization of a new perfume. It has happened with a lot of perfumes. Um, uh, I want, I love to call reorchestrations sometimes with, for example, what I did with Fougère Royale, uh, the Fougère Royale that is sold by Ubigan, which you have right there uh, on, 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 your, on, your, on your left, it is actually my idea of using the Fougère elements in order to create, create, I'm saying create, in order to make a contemporary perfume. So it ended up smelling very Fougère-like, even almost like Spanish Fougère, and I am kind of, kind of flattering myself, like a Maja de Mirugia kind of story. Um, but at the same time, it, ha it has a contemporary feeling to it, and it has all of the elements of Fougère. It has the coumarin, it has the geranium, it has the ogmos, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of, okay, what is a reimagination? Also, the work that I have done for several several of the conceptual ideas of, 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 of the House of Legalion with my friend Nicolas Chabot, uh, only, only last year, uh, Burrasca and Jasmine were launched. Burrasca and Jasmine exist as historical perfumes. Uh, I have very, very, very uh, uh, precise information about the formulas. But what was the use of just putting those elements together in a bottle and then put, put them out? So we kind of uh, injected a little bit of radioactivity in one of them for the Jasmine, uh, because we gave it a little bit of a sheep reflection and then a very crazy, a little bit marine note. Uh, and and for Burras, we utilize the idea of this encounter of sandalwood and patchouli with animalic notes in order to go through the genealogy of La Chipre that Burras itself was a little bit of a Miss Dior type kind of thing, and uh, it became something else. So that is reorchestration. And then, of course, utilitarian formulation that we have to do because, as we all know, there's raw materials that they have, you know, questionable things happening, or some countries don't like them, or or some of them are not available anymore, etc. So you have to re re remake the perfume. Um, and that could be a subject of one hour. We're not going to get into right, that. No. And, but but I, guess, I guess, I guess what are, you're some saying of, is... Some of them I have participated. I guess what you're saying is the answer is it just depends. Some you will, some yeah. you won't, depends on the other. And, and, yeah. and what, you know, how do you define reformulation you know, as well? Yeah. Now, one, one, we need to tread carefully with the next question now because we need to keep this question in the abstract. There are lots and lots of perfumes that, according to the internet out there, maybe you have made them, maybe you have not. Who knows? Who knows what's correct on the internet? But how, how does that feel, this thing of, you know, you know what you have made and what you haven't made? How does it feel that you're not able to talk about it? And do you ever, do you ever have a moment where actually maybe a perfume is falsely misattributed, you know, to somebody else, and you're sitting there going, but I made it, I made it, and I can't say that I made well, that it. that hasn't happened, you know. It's okay, like, good. <laughs> you know, like, for example, if you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Radiant Flower by XYZ brand is out in the market, and then suddenly in the press it appears that it was it was not made by Bradley Cooper, but it was made by Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Jackman kind of story, that has <laughs> not happened. It has happened to other people. Uh, and this is mostly because of mistakes, not because okay. of the wheel. But sometimes, you know, in some in some instances, and thank God not a lot, the perfumer is a ghost writer. When I started studying perfumery back in the 80s, I do have to tell you that I was a normal MO. It was very, very, very rare that you knew 
which perfume had made a perfume. It was really, really into the insiders, insiders of the industry that you knew that Rudnitska had made Osovas, or you knew that uh, uh, Josephine Catapano had made Fiji. You know, those, that was really kind of really, really tricky information. It was out there, but of course it was it was not, you know, it was not a conversation to be had during a dinner. Now the internet is another story, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's things that are undeniable. Um, I follow the rules. If, if, if a brand considers that, that, uh, that the, 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 the paternity, maternity of perfume, the, 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 pa the paternity, whatever it is, whatever <laughs> word, you know, you get, you, I get crazy with the gender thing now anyway, uh, <laughs> which is fine, I think, I suppose. Um, it, 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 they, they decide it's not part of their branding. It's it's fine, you know. It's part of the mantra of because also the perfumer doesn't work. For, I don't work for myself. I work for myself emotionally. You know, I will never present uh, uh, one of my clients, one of my interlocutors, a perfume that I don't like. If I don't like it, I'm not. I'm not gonna present it. You know, it's like I. Uh, it's not I, I like imagine I have to fall in love with every single perfume that I made or like I don't know Tomo Finland who had to be sexually aroused by the drawing he was drawing you know it's not it's not about that but it's about like okay if you are presenting a perfume that you don't really love and you know that you're it's going to go through the curve of, of development through a year you're going to be stuck uh, you're going to be stuck with a friend that maybe limps you know so it has you have to be very careful with that and. Um, and if there's if there's a moment that that you know you are giving that to a brand, you're giving that to another universe, you're giving that to another creator, etc. Okay, so uh, you know that the, the dialogue continues there. So okay, no, cool. Thank you. A question here from Denby. From the point of view of admiring the formula or the construction of a perfume, which one do you wish you had made? I mean, obviously this is one that you haven't made. Which one do you wish you'd made, and why? Uh, there's several perfumes that I go, wow, that was smart, and or wow, that is absolutely gorgeous. But, you know, I go back to the Orissimo as well, and and uh, that is, it actually goes beyond if I wish I had made it. Uh, I I respect and adore that perfume so much that if somebody would tell me, I'm going to show you Runitska's notebook with a formula, I would say no, 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 no. You know, so, sometimes the secret has to be kept secret. And uh, that I also I also find about the, the smell of honeysuckle and magnolia. Mother Nature has secrets in those two flowers. And I think that the moment they are revealed, uh, or maybe they're revealed and I haven't found it in, the, in my research, okay? I will be a, li a little bit a little bit kind of, oh, that was it, you know? Because, you know, there's, there's tricks in perfumery, et cetera, et cetera. So Giorissimo is definitely one, one of the perfumes. It, it is also very important because then you get attached to perfume that you wear. And I wish I had made many other perfumes that I love. Uh, but also, uh, I respect and admire ideas. And some ideas like, wow, that is a clever idea. You know, wow, that was very interesting. So over Some overdoses, sometimes I go like, whoa, OK. Uh, an overdose of the raw material. So, uh, so you know, it, 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 it goes to a, to a level of understanding of, of uh, um, uh, I am. I have never been a jealous or an envious person, so I kind of applaud the others, the 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 other people's work and the other people's achievement, and and I admire many things. Uh, so so saying so so you know saying like I wish I would have done that had a little bit of tinge of, of green envy, and it does not me. I applaud and 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 praise. Sounds good. Um, Elva Nui here is saying. Do you have a specific perfume, I'm guessing that you've made, that goes perfectly with a specific or special book or beloved story in your mind? Well, uh, that's a difficult one because it's more about little passages and it's about... Uh, mm, let me take it from a bigger picture, and I yeah. always I always mention him. Uh, there's a Mexican poet. His name is Carlos Pellicer, and um, Carlos Pellicer uh, wrote an incredible poem. Uh, I, I want to say in the 1930s or 40s, and it's a long, lengthy poem, and it, it, it talks. It's called the, the speech on behalf of the flowers. So it, you know the premise is about you know flowers can speak. So I'm going to speak for them, and I'm going to praise them, and I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my adoration to flowers. And and so being a Mexican, being born in tropical Mexico, he's very in tune with nature. Even if he lives in a city, he goes 
he goes to the countryside every day and he kind of mentions that very assertively in this poem. And there's a moment that I think uh, not only kind of, uh, and I, I mention this all the time, uh, not only kind of he kind of nails perfectly the personality of Mexico, but it also nails a lot of the things I feel. And and so, so you know, definitely a source of inspiration, definitely a little bit of mantra for me. And the little passage says, the Mexican people has two obsessions. He, it stays for death and the love for flowers. And uh, you were talking about uh, me being known as a perfumer who does encounters and contrast and uh, light and dark uh, tension and so on. And that's exactly what it is. You know, it's like there's nothing more alive than a flower. And, 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 and the flower is going to beget life. A flower is a sexual organ and there's nothing more alive than sex because, because sex creates life. And there's nothing more deader than dead. <laughs> so, so the two interests of the Mexican mind and the Mexican existence that go between flowers and there is something that alimentates my, that nourishes my, my, my work all the time. I am a botanist, as you know, so flowers, plants, fruits, trees are very, very important in my, right now I'm just uh, writing the description and the list of ingredients for the new perfume that, that, that that Carlos, Carlos Uber and I were finalizing that again deserves one hour of conversation and we will talk about it um, later on. But uh, I am I am putting, you know, a, a very specific wood that comes from Central Africa that I know and, and, and I know how it's used uh, and I know the smell, et cetera, et cetera. But I am also, you know, talk, talking about, about other ingredients that are a little bit uncanny, you know, like, I don't know, uh, specific kinds of seaweed and so on. Uh, so then I go, okay, is there, that is back to botany, that is back to my upbringing, because my mother was a biologist, my father was was not a tree hogger, but a tree lover. And, and, and yes, and uh, so it goes back to that. So, cool. so uh, it is more, uh, you know, it, if I would say, oh, yes, you know, uh, I made this perfume because I was thinking of 100 Years of Solitude of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yes, but it's not exactly that. We need to... One line of something that you read that sticks in your mind, it does work. No, that, that makes sense. Exactly. And like, like I guess, like a moment in a film or something like that. Oh, yes, what, many of those, that's for sure. What's the, what's the most uh, misunderstood aspect of your job? What's the, what's the bit that people most misunderstand, I think, about being a perfumer? Um, there, actually, there's two. First of all, you know, the mechanics of the job and the mechanics of the industry are still very misunderstood. Some of those things when you have been very clear in opening up the industry and opening up, you know, the knowledge and, 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 and allowing visitors in visitors in a metaphorical way, you know, in order to inform inform the, 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 the general public, let's say, I don't want to sound pompous, what is that? Um, uh, but then they, they, they think that I mix three ingredients and that's the perfume that they are buying in, in, in Bloomingdale's. And, you know, the, the, the intricacies of, of, of how a perfume is made, how is it produced, how is it sourced, uh, what are the levels? You know, who is the licensee? Who is the designer? What is the role of the bottle maker? Uh, so sometimes when I say I make, uh, I, I work in the perfume industry, I, that kind of works well because I say the word industry. Otherwise, you say I, I'm a perfumer. Uh, so, oh, so you spray perfume in Saks Fifth Avenue, or are you one of those people who makes essential oils in order to make uh, people feel better with COVID, or are you? Uh, um, do you have your brand? Etc. So there's a lot of misconceptions. Again, there's, there's out there a lot of education. Uh, and the other thing that sometimes kind of it unnerves me, uh, some people think the perfume is superficial, uh, that the perfume is frivolous. And uh, I think exactly the contrary. And here I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to kind of talk about uh, something that my father told me once. And you know, my father is recently passed, so it's it's uh, it's a good conversation. Because one day I was precisely thinking that I was visiting him in Mexico. We're having a, a glass of tequila, sipping tequila. We don't do shots of good tequila. You sip it. You you appreciate it. And I said, you know, my industry, perfume. I'm not curing cancer. I am not signing peace treaties. Uh, you know, uh, I am not governing a country. Uh, you know, it's so unimportant, so superficial, so shallow, so glib, and so on. He's just looking at me. My father was a doctor in physics, you know. Uh, so 
his head was, you know, towards, okay, chaos and order and, and quantum physics and the, the origins of the universe and, and fractals and, you know, gravitational waves and stuff like that. And then he looked at me, you are so wrong. Actually, he used an expletive. He said, you are wrong. And yeah. uh, for a man who was not a lot, you know, exciting, but he was very angry, he, he would swear, but not in general, uh, normal, you know, colloquialisms. And I go, oh, okay, so I'm interested. What do you think? He said, I sincerely think, and, and said, I'm not going to overflatter you, I'm not gilding your lily, but I sincerely think that perfumers have possibly one of the two most important roles in society and one of the vital, vital jobs next possibly to medical doctors. And I go, oh, oh my we God. like the sound of him. Please tell me yes. he expanded. Yes, of course. And said, okay, <laughs> again, so give me us. Because thanks to you guys, and thanks to the product you make, and I say it in all the levels, from the soap to the shampoo to the fine fragrance and so on, you cover the scent of decay. And in every single culture, the thing that scares most the mind is death and decay and rottening. And... Uh, using a perfume you are covering that and you are helping us forget what we fear the most i like it i like it and uh, so, so that was an enormous pat in the shoulder and, no, absolutely. Uh, and absolutely. I, I, I mentioned you know my, my my father jorge flores valdez you know because he was talking about you know entropy and you know the tendency of of the energy of the planet to go into disorder to die to decay to, to corrupt and and he was saying the perfume maybe will not stop the process but will help our living feeling mind and heart to forget about the process because the process it what really 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 scares us and to which i would add as well that bringing beauty into the world can never ever be seen as being superficial or trivial now i cannot believe this but we are pretty much out of time I've got one tiny little question left, and and you'll have to answer it in a in a tiny way. Even though I don't want to kind of put the put, put you know pull you back. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. Thank you very much uh, for for asking such wonderful questions, uh, Rodrigo. I asked this question in in an interview I recently did with somebody else, uh, so I don't like to repeat questions, but I think this one is worth repeating. The industry, the perfume industry, same as many, many industries, particularly retail, has taken a real beating in the last year. What can we do? What should be done to help people reconnect with perfume again, to get people smelling perfume, buying perfume? Can you answer that in like 30 seconds? Well, uh, try try to try them. You know, they're still there. They're available for everybody. Uh, and uh, And just try to... It is difficult because, you know, we're confined, but at the same time, thank God there's the internet. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of, you know, a big commitment to buy a bottle of perfume that costs 125 pounds uh, uh, without smelling it, that's for sure. But I think the connection to perfume has been uh, has been incremented. There's an increase of the connection of perfume because of well-being, because of emotion, because of uh, of the longing of somebody, somebody that, that you don't see. And I think particularly the last the last thing and and that that is a subject that is going to come more and more and more it is uh, perfume will serve us as a conduit to to our loved ones it has always been like that perfume is communication per, per, perfume is relationship but uh, but right in this moment that we okay we're kind of possibly picking up we're getting into a better moment than a year ago than two months ago uh, but still we don't know there's a lot of unknown there's a lot of you know uh, in, in, like like incognitas but in this particular thing uh, uh, ways perfume it will it, we have to use perfume again as a, as a method of communication. Perfume, perfumes are conversations, perfume are conversation starters and finishers. And, uh, and uh, it's a language that we all speak, even if, if it's wordless. So uh, I think that approaching emotionally the product and then trying to use it in order to make your life better, particularly for the longing of others, I think that, that it opens a dam of, of, of great moments for everyone. That's a wonderful answer, Rodrigo. 
Sincerely, truly, I cannot thank you enough for your time. I cannot thank you for being your wonderfully articulate self. Everybody watching could listen to you for hours. And please say that you will come back for part two one day before too long, maybe to talk about the new artists. And maybe we could have you and Carlos together. That would be nice to have. We, we, we could work on that. It's, it's almost finished, meaning I think the formulation. And then we also can talk about finishing. What, what is the finishing? in perfume because I, I have a lot of philosophical things to say there um but we are close to that so of course we will reach out to you and you know carlos appreciates you very much so we can do something about his new his new endeavor which is also i actually fun. haven't had much contact with him for a long time so you've nudged me to send him a little email thank you very much stay safe thank you to everybody for watching and we will be back with more love at first sense soon take care rodrigo thank you darius and I'm dying to go see you in London, so we will we will organize that as soon as we can.